Hello and welcome to My Book, a podcast show about books and their authors with a South Asian touch. I'm Parvez Alam. In this episode, I'm going to be in conversation with Shahbaz Tasir, who has written the book Lost to the World: A Memoir of Faith, Family, and Five Years in Terrorist Captivity. The book is based on true incidents. Shahbaz Tasir is a Pakistani businessman who made global headlines in August 2011 when he was driving to his office in Lahore, Pakistan, where he was dragged from his car at gunpoint and kidnapped by a group of Taliban affiliated militants. He was frequently tortured and forced to endure extreme cruelty. In the beginning it was isolation, it was torture, it was beatings, it was you know nails they pulled all of my nails out. they pulled the nails out of my feet uh, they used to take knives and blades and they used to cut my back in straight lines and then across every day and they used to throw salt on it and all of this was videotaped from my mother and she had to watch every second forward it there were no pictures they were detailed disgusting videos my bones were sticking and i had no mu- i had no muscle i just i was just bones and they would bury me in the ground for 12 hours um, Shahbaz Tasir for almost 5 years Shahbaz was held captive in Pakistan and Afghanistan just 7 months earlier his father Salman Tasir the governor of Punjab province had been shot dead by his guard for speaking out against Pakistan's blasphemy laws lost to the world a memoir of faith family and 5 years in terrorist captivity by Shahbaz Tasir has been published by Penguin Random House I'm in London and Shahbaz Tasir is joining me online from Pakistan's historic city Lahore. Shahbaz, welcome to the Sinning Podcast show My Book. For almost a decade you were described as a businessman, but this year onwards I suppose the description has changed. Now you're an author. Which description or title does suit you better? Uh I like both of them. Um you know the reason that i wrote this book was so i would be in the same company as my grandfather and my father and that means a lot to me uh, personally and of course you know business wise i i'm trained my brother and i were trained by abba to you know take over his businesses we worked under him and so both the titles hold equal uh, uh, meaning for me personally uh but the author one is a very it's something that i'm getting used to it's, it's a wonderful compliment especially if it comes from a place where people enjoyed the book and uh, you know as a writer um it's the only thing you want is to connect with the reader for them to you know for you to have articulated your experience in a way that they can relate to it and and it's a, it's a lovely gift actually it's the best gift that i've uh, gotten uh, you know from my freedom besides my children is this uh, title of author <laughs> i'm so happy you talked about your grandfather grandfather mohammeddin tasir uh, in short uh, he's known as md tasir a legendary scholar from south asia region someone who went on to do his phd in literature very kind of a unique you know distinction uh, during those days he was the first indian to do it uh from the subcontinent so it's a uh, honor actually okay so uh, what have you been told about him uh, senior tasir sahab md tasir sahab uh, what was his contribution to the literature i have to tell you that you know how there's parents edu- you know are involved in your education from when you're a child and i think usually that's very academic oriented but my mother used to look after the academic side of our education and my father i think maybe one or two years he took out to specifically concentrate with me on my academics but other than that my brother and i would sit every day with him and we would have history lectures physics lectures uh poetry lessons uh we would be given books to read that had nothing to do with our curriculum or our age as a matter of fact i mean i read nelson mandela's uh memoir when i was i think 12 or 13 and in a similar way the first urdu book that i read was my grandfather's uh, book of uh, poems and uh, we had to memorize some of them you know as uh, little kids it was very difficult hum uh, thode se wo hum american school jate the so uh, sharmate bhi the urdu bolne se 
बड़ी ये जिंदगी में यू नो मच लेटर ऑन इन आर लाइफ डिट वी बिकम वेरी प्राउड ऑफ दिस लैंग्वेज एंड द पार्ट दैट इट प्लेज इन आर लाइफ आई वॉज ट्वेंटी वन एंड आई एक्चुअली हेल्ड गैदरिंग that my father helped me organize at the governor's house he was the governor at the time so he helped me but what i wanted to do was to get um, all these very famous artists together and to recite my dada's poetry for an audience and we recorded it as a matter of fact and uh, you know again it, in the little personal accomplishments in your life it was one of my most amazing moments because not only did i make my father proud but i managed to get all these people Uh, to sit down and listen to dada's poetry uh, sung by modern artists and it was it was a wonderful experience so you know growing up my grandfather in this house uh, we were told that you know this this name that you have is one that your grandfather took it was his name as a scholar it was his name as a poet as a writer and honoring this name is something that has been embedded in all of the children uh, all of my father's children all of his uh, grandchildren and you know each one if you ever meet us uh, you they proud to be a tasi and that comes from uh, dada and briefly i think uh, for those who uh, probably do not know uh, senior tasi's connection with faiz ahmed faiz sahab the my father great, dada. El- absolutely legendary poet so yes uh, share uh, some of those details as well who was married to whom so uh, dada was married to christabel uh, and faiz uh, dada was married to alice uh, uh, dadi and basically uh, you know she was my father's khala so he was his khalu and mere liye to he was you know uh, i call him khalu dada <laughs> he named uh, myself and my younger brother um, or played a part in naming us abba you know was quite proud of <laughs> naming us as well um, but uh, but he was my grandfather died with abba was very young maybe 6 years he was 4 or 6 years old and so he grew up with just uh, stories about his own father and he didn't know him that way um, and he learned about him not just through my dadi but through his best friend who was faiz ahmed faiz and what a wonderful way to learn about your father so you know abba had a very uh, high uh, standard that he set for himself because of who his father was and he set those standards for his children because of who their grandfather was um you know being the first uh, man from the subcontinent to do your phd in english literature from cambridge is is you know as amazing as it, as it, as it sounds and education wise work ethic wise in any way of uh, of our lives it's it's very much been part of it and fares uh, dada what nobody knows about is all of abba's political uh, beliefs and his struggles and some of his convictions and some of the things that he fought for and some of the things that he stood for and some of the things that he ended up giving his life for it all came from uh, from this revolutionary um, so you know he he is the man who molded sant asid and educated sant asid and when he ran the pakistan times when abba opened the daily times with najm sethi this is what they this is the dynamic duo that they wanted to be was faiz ahmed faiz and mia iftikharuddin so uh, this you know these were the uh, you know these were the people that they aspired to be like and this is an amazing backdrop of your family shabaz kehta na ke fakhr hota hai aise khandan mein paida hona aur uske baad mein aise aise log jinke aas paas aap pale bade ho coming back to your father salman tasir sahab he was a politician before becoming the governor of punjab and he used to work for the pakistan people's party yes uh well you know he gave up politics in the 90s and uh, he was a businessman before he was a politician as well uh he gave up his businesses to come to pakistan and fight uh, against zia ul haq and it was a very difficult battle uh it was a battle in which he didn't just uh, sacrifice all the things that he created uh but also a lot of years of his life uh, his family life his family itself it was a very difficult uh, 10 12 years of his life and then he went into business and again i think he had incredible success as a businessman which is why he was invited uh, to be the governor he had lots of hopes and he wanted to do so many things um, 
and that was his real passion by the way i can go on about his business side of things i think that was a need he always said that this is something i i have to do every day uh, to survive you know because i didn't inherit anything in my life so i only had to create to sustain myself but his love was for it and that's where he felt like salman tasir like salman tasir let me come to the year 2011 when your father salman tasir was assassinated by his own guard what were you doing at the time where were you um very difficult um i was actually on the phone with him uh, oh, he was God. in kosar market yeah and uh, he was uh, he just eaten his soup at his famous there's a famous little restaurant in kosar market and he had his soup and he was actually talking to my mother it was my younger brother's birthday so i had come home from office early i bought my brother an xbox and abba was supposed to come at night and we were having like a dinner and we were all really excited so when i walked into my mother's room she was on the phone <clears throat> on loudspeaker with abba mm-hmm. and i just said can you give me the phone and i took the phone and i was like uh, i heard your government's going so he started laughing and he's like why uh, i used to say your government because i was a pmlq supporter i voted okay. for okay so i voted for pmlq and my father was just like wanted to kill me <laughs> i couldn't believe it um so i said you know i heard your government is going the mqm is resigning from the assemblies and your government is on its way so he laughed and he's like and he said ke ye jo bhi kar le hamari hukumat 5 saal pure khatam karegi and uh, and anyways then i said when are you coming home he said i'm just uh, grabbing a book and uh, and i'm going to the house packing up and i'm heading for lahore and i gave the phone to my mother and i just walked out of her room and walked out into my uh, garage and i got a call from my khala it literally 25 30 seconds and she said there's been a bomb blast in kosar market and uh, is your father okay and i said that's ridiculous See, the, the the haunting thing about that conversation was that i knew he was in kosar market. so the fact that she called me 30 seconds later and said that there's been a blast i i couldn't actually um, i couldn't put it together but i had so much hope because i had just been on the phone with him and i ran back into my mother's room and she wasn't on the phone with him and she was reading a magazine and i said when did you get off the phone with abai and she said i just shut it as soon as you left the room i i shut the phone and so i said call him and uh, she called him and his phone was ringing but he didn't pick up and when she called him again it was off then i called his military secretary a uh, very nice man and uh, he basically when i called him the first thing he said to me is i've heard as well and i'm on it and that's when this very strange feeling that i you know as a son i um they say that uh, you know your my my parents would always tell me that the worst thing that can happen to a parent is to bury their child um but i've uh, never been able to uh, just you know what happened that day with my dad because that's what he was for me uh, you know i'm always asked about his politics and his business and the amazing man that he was and he was a phenomenal man i'm so proud by the one of the most amazing privileges of my life has been this time that i've managed to spend with him in such a personal capacity as a son um you only realize it when they're gone um but you know i anyways i then received a call maybe 10 15 minutes later the tvs warned there were reports that he'd been shot at um and was being rushed to the hospital and we you know we were on a phone call getting information and uh, our bus friends were coming to the house mama's friends are coming and i just you know kept thinking this it's not a funeral why are you coming like this my father's going to be fine because he was such a huge figure really he was larger than life anything that someone can say about him is not enough it's uh, it can never explain the kind of larger than life character he was and uh, i'll never forget the colonel called me and said that we're rushing we're bringing him to lahore and these were his words and i said are you mad i'm catching the next plane to uh, islamabad and he needs the best uh, medical care that he can get right now and we're on our way and he said shabaz um, who were bringing his body and i'll never forget because i was um, you know i was actually standing in a place uh, that i spent so much time with my father and uh, it, it's our courtyard in our house outside my father's bedroom 
and every morning as a as a 16 year old he basically you know saw that he's having a little bit too much fun in life so he what he did was he said that you will wake up at 7:30 every morning and you will have breakfast with me and read the newspapers with me. and the only thing that i'll ensure through this exercise is that you will be asleep at a time where you can't get up to any god for sake and uh, harkats that you know young young boys are you know do in school and stuff but it what uh, what it turned out to be was like an extra university like another you know bachelor's degree in life literally because i would discuss politics i would you know i was telling you anyways we discussed history but it was just extra time with him and he would be strategizing about business and i just spent so many years of my life in that courtyard every single morning with him and uh, it was a very difficult call and then the worst part about the call was not just that i had to digest this information but i could see across the courtyard my mother and my younger brother and my younger sister sitting there with no idea of what's happening and uh, i had to go and do this and you know i i say this uh, to people that as someone who's been kidnapped and extensively tortured and kept in you know solitary confinement uh, this is the hardest thing the hardest thing that i ever had to do in my life uh, and i said goodbye to my mother. been at peace with saying goodbye to her uh, but uh, it's just you know and it's it's a wound that never it never heals you know i have a sense of triumph over my own experience my kidnapping my torturers my you know abductors i, I have a huge sense of uh, pride in, and uh, but when i speak about my father or i speak about that day it's 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 a wound that never heals and it's you said the hardest thing for you of course was uh, his funeral and the way you see the news of his death and assassination uh, for me the saddest thing is that he was killed because he raised his voice to defend a girl called asia bibi and those blasphemy laws they were outrageous i mean for and your father was also suggesting that these laws should not be misused sir they can uh, i'm going to uh, i'll be really blunt and honest the thing is um, all laws are there to uplift and to govern and create a sense of stability in society laws can be misused but mostly they are there to uplift society to create opportunity to empower people to give them rights you know so that we are not we are not animals um and all of these laws that are part of the constitution of pakistan are man made laws there's this because if you study the quran you realize there's just really no connection whatsoever and you can't say that in the name of religion i create these man made laws that's not how god works right god has a set of laws and or you follow those or you have your constitutions and your set of laws and and if you are following those laws they should be you should be able to amend them you should be able to debate them all of them i don't mind sitting across a, a supporter of my father's murder and having a debate let's let's debate you want to use religion you want to use a constitution you want to bring a moral aspect to it but we should be able to debate about what's right and what's wrong i'm i'm even willing to go at these lengths because i've actually had these debates with my kidnappers who were militants and who were waging a war against the state of pakistan to implement their understanding of religious laws if they are willing to have debates and engage in debates uh who who, who why would some 17 year old be radicalized to pick up a gun and kill the governor that his job is to protect um so you know this is all abba wanted he just wanted a debate about the amendment of laws because as asia bibi's case proof it's a historic case uh because it can be used as a precedent uh, anywhere not just pakistan but anywhere if a religious minority is being persecuted this this case is it's a supreme court case so the what happens is in inside asia bibi's case is very important because what it says is the woman committed no act of blasphemy she was wrongly accused of committing blasphemy and that the man murdered was doing his job which as the governor of punjab is to protect the weak that is his constant he has sworn with his hand on the quran to uphold the constitution of pakistan 
and this is one of those things that he is committed to is to protect actually you know the problem is that when we see politicians when we we see opportunity contracts and you know this and that and corruption and this but really their job is like i mentioned to uplift and to help the weakest of of our society so it's an unbelievable uh, judgment in that case and what it's done is i'll never get any um, uh, you you can never make me feel bad you know but my father didn't die for me and and so that's why i also have to look at my wins in perspective and this judgment is a huge win for my father because what it does is it not only sets a precedent but it also claims that he was wrongfully murdered and anyone who the, 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 there's a reason why laws are there the police is there courts are there you have to go there you cannot accuse someone in the streets make up your mind and decide to kill them personally it's a huge tragedy but as a pakistani this decision is historic and monumental for us very historic and uh, it was the same year 2011 when your father was assassinated 7 months later something happened to you share some of those details please because i know it's horrendous to talk about those things again and again but you have oh, written a book it's uh, important for you also to talk about it is equally important for me and for millions of people to understand how it works what had happened how did you feel and how did you come out of that you know it was such a uh, because i do it every day i go to work the same place i live in the same house so you know for me it's like part of my routine and uh, it was an ordinary day for me just like any other day like today i uh, you know i've come home a little early for this but you know i i take the same road to work the same car to work um i was on my way to work i'd come back from dubai and uh, it was 9:45 in the morning i was actually late and uh, as i was turning i my office is on mm alam road which if you have been to lahore it's like the main commercial road uh, all the brands are there all the offices are there all the multinationals are there and so mine is the first uh, turn and i literally took the turn and went into the side lane and i was jumped by uh, 10 masked men with guns and uh, i before i just thought it's a car i had a fancy car so i thought you know run today is that day you always hear about stories in karachi but very rarely in uh, lahore but anyways i thought you know the today is your lucky day to get car jacked and so i took my key i actually dropped the key on the side but i had my wallet i had a watch i just started saying take all of this there's no need they instantly started hitting me with uh, the clash and cops and directing me towards the car that was in the front and i was following instructions i had my hands up i, I just the only thing i did was i i had a, my car had a start button so i put it off and i slipped the key in the side pocket because i actually i i really did love the car and i didn't want them to succeed in uh, in uh, taking it uh, anyways um, as i got into their vehicle and they sped off i again they were kicking me and gun butting me so i said listen there's no need for this i've given you money i've given you my watch uh, you know you've got the car just drop me on the side and and i'm not even going to go to the police man take 3 4 days relax and the guy in the front seat who turned out to be my kidnapper uh, his name was mohammed ali and he was in uzbek and he turned back and he looked at me and he spoke in perfect urdu he, he said uh, shabaz main tumhare liye aaya hu shabaz i've come for you and really it's uh, you know some i can never explain I just before got getting off that plane uh, from Dubai, I'd watched A Mighty Heart, which is about Daniel Pearl. Why I decided to watch that, I have no idea. But I just this is the last movie I'd seen, and literally just gotten off the plane. The entire story had just played in front of me, and I knew that there's the only reason he knows who I am is because he's you know, and and I and. The seven months that we'd spent in Pakistan after Abbas' murder were not easy either. and we were getting continuous constant death threats and uh, my younger sister was sent these pictures of beheaded people in in her mail and when she opened it it was just pictures of beheaded people with a note saying you're next and uh, my mother had a grenade thrown out outside her office and uh, without a pen so it was like a warning it was very difficult and then you know you had these very illiterate and uneducated um, people creating a narrative on the media i'll never forget 
a lot of politicians who sh- didn't, you know, shying away. I can respect because of the intensity of the issue, but coward, cowardly behavior um, ran for for the hills, as a matter of fact, and uh, it's very demoralizing um, because we refused to leave the country as well. We got uh, the Americans offered us a refugee. We, my brother and I just refused. We said, I, I would rather die. Uh, you know. When was this? Uh, when were they this was offered? Before, before I was uh, kidnapped. Before your kidnapping, uh, after your father's assassination. Yeah? Assassination. Because it was felt somehow, somewhere, that uh, your family was not safe. Is that correct to say? Yeah, yeah that, that was. Uh, oh, I mean, whether it was the intelligence agencies, whether it was the government, whether it was. Uh, you know, uh, ambassadors from different country, council general. I mean, they all were literally begging us that you could, do not understand how dangerous the situation is. We are getting, you know, reports from our intelligence agencies about, like, just just think about every single person in this country is targeting you, uh, that can target you is targeting you. Uh, so, you know, that's scary because we were fighting a full-on war on terror. You could see what was happening with the suicide blasts and, you know, things like this. It was very unnerving, like, you know, before I got kidnapped, even stopping at a traffic light, I, I you know, I, I'd start because people on motorcycles and like just look at you the wrong way and you are thinking more in your head because of your personal situation than what's actually but turned out that, you know, seven months into uh, after Abba died, I was abducted by and not just, a, you know, like they're in the militant hierarchy. There's so many people that could take you. Uh, but I got picked up by the worst, um, which is this Uzbeks. Um, and even if you speak to people in Pakistani intelligence or, you know, in the U.S. intelligence, they will tell you that they are just not human beings. They were the Uzbek fighters, Taliban. So they're mainly Central Asians. So the Uzbeks had their own group. It was called the INU, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, or Uzbekistan Islami Harakat. Um and basically, it was a group of Central Asians, mainly Uzbeks. It was founded by an Uzbek called Muhammad Tahir Farooq, uh, you know, who was in, in, again, the hierarchy of terrorists. He was more senior than Osama bin Laden. And he's actually really? the reason for the Iraq insurgency, yes. So he and uh, he was Baitullah Masood's uh, mentor. So the Pakistan insurgency, the Iraq insurgency, he was the mentor of both the men that started it. And he was Mullah Umar's most important, like, you know, one of his most important outside of his direct Taliban circle, because this was another group. And he was Amirul Mahajirin. So Mullah Umar was Amirul Mominin, as in the Amir of all the Muslims. And he was the Amirul Mahajirin, the Amir of all the immigrants inside the Caliphate. And so it's a very senior position in the world of crazy people, um, as I used to joke. Um, so he was a very senior senior guy. And so the group had a very high standing amongst the Afghan Taliban, who in the terrorist world are the number one, uh, you know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. They might be operating internationally and they might have carved, uh, like ISIS is obviously carved out land. But what the Taliban have done in Afghanistan, no other, you can't even call them a group anymore now. They're a government. Now they're yeah. officially yeah. a government. So they're not even a group. They're not a terrorist group. So, you know, to be in such a high standing uh, position in a place like this, the Uzbeks were, you know, front frontline fighters, frontline suicide bombers, gave the fatwas for beheadings, introduced that walkie-talkie that they all use, the, the Uzbeks introduced, explained to them how to use it because, you know, they've been at war since... No, I, I'm just trying to understand what were they doing in Lahore? They just came to kidnap you? Otherwise, they were based somewhere yes. else? No, so they're based... Uh, all of these groups at the time of my kidnapping were operating from Mirali and Miransha, which are two cities inside Waziristan in Pakistan. Um, and it, this is a very no-go area. It is a war zone. And the military is actually has been fighting against these people since, you know, since it cleared Swat, since it cleared Gilgit. Then this is where these people came. So this insurgency, that you know, they, it started, I think, in 2005. And by 2006, 2007, you know, 2011, they had moved these people into Miransha, Mirali. This was the region where they ran and operated. And not one group, hundreds of groups. 
lashkar e jangvi afghan taliban the pakistani taliban the uzbeks then there were other groups like the chechnyans had their own groups the somalian al qaeda was you know different um the uyghurs had a group um Uh, the tajiks had a group the kirgiz had a group uh, they were people from place there was a south korean in my group who negotiated with my mother you know i mean there were people like that was more vibrant and international than islamabad but just you know unfortunately it was crazy very so unfortunate they, ferocious notorious and and very ruthless brutal so uh, uh, what i wanted to just finish really quick was so all of these groups that operated from merely in miransha they had terror cells in pakistan in all the cities in quetta in karachi in lahore in islamabad and this is how they make money they'll kidnap someone you've never even heard of them 10 lakh you know million rupees kidnap someone for a crore kidnap someone for 2 crores kidnap someone for 20 lakhs kidnap someone for this shias they'll target shia community they'll emdi community they target minorities because they quick to pay they sunni militants and what happens is they you start the conversation being a kafir so if you don't pay quickly you're already on and they've set precedent of beheading they they don't you know so the this is how the groups fund and run you are listening to the sineing podcast show my book shehbaz tasir the author of the book lost to the world A memoir of faith, family, and five years in terrorist captivity is in conversation with Parvez Alam. His much-talked-about book has been published by Penguin Random House. Please visit our website for other podcasts in Hindi, Urdu, and English at cineink.com. Cineink is a hub of podcasts based in London. Pakistan is a country of 220 million people. you can extort a lot of people so i was actually their first very high level target you know no one had ever wandered off into territory like this hmm. but just before me they had kidnapped an american diplomat called warren weinstein and then shortly after me they kidnapped the former prime minister's son as well so you know as far as they were concerned they were executing their plans pretty well and i was kidnapped on the 26th of august and on the 28th of august i was in uh, meerut you were so, in mir ali and then uh, by that time had they briefed you about their demands and money or uh, were they so in touch no, with your family no they didn't do anything like that so they kept me i think uh, for a month without any information and they never got in touch with my family either and then after a month very in a hollywood manner they got in touch with my family and what they did was they set up a huge la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah black banner and they had like you know nine guys masked up in you know vests and guns and everything and had little old me in a Guantanamo Bay kind of orange outfit and handcuffed and uh, you know guys had guns on my head and they it was the first time after almost a month or two months uh, being with them that I, it was the first time i heard their demand and the demand was something like 65 million dollars and 25 militants and i just <laughs> remember thinking i'm dead you know they i'm just i'm going to die you are saying 65 million dollars and 20 yeah, so, so terrorists they, so in they, exchange so they actually wanted it in rupees and right. when they asked uh, it was 4 billion rupees and at the time the dollar was at 86 or 85 but when it hit 92 they called my mother up and they said listen we asked in pkr but it was we hedged it with the dollar so you have to adjust <laughs> shabaz i mean uh, honestly appreciated the way you have taken the whole thing and during various interviews i have seen you talking about it a face of catharsis for you and at the same time you know one could see a lot of black humor so much satire a bit of a bit of comedy a bit of greek tragedy in your book and at the end of the day obviously it was a horror horror for you uh, to remain in that captivity for 5 years but then the way you have taken it the way you have described all that ordeal in various bits and phases so let me come to this the black humor because you just talked about it there was this korean guy i have heard you also speaking on this because i had attended a session here in london during the pakistan literature festival 
Amina Sayyid had organized a beautiful festival and there you spoke and there were hundreds of people listening to you, watching you. I got goosebumps when you were talking about some of those uh, stories, the torture that you have to bear and face. Uh, so I'm coming back to this Korean guy. Just put him in perspective and let the people see that how bizarre, you know, this story is in certain, uh, you know, segments. And also you are saying that they had this kalma, you know, saying that in yeah. the name of, you know, Allah, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And they are demanding a ransom. Uh, yes. Ransom. I mean, it's not a religious issue. You hadn't done anything against your religion. Uh, you were a follower of the religion. And yet uh, they are demanding this ransom. They are calling it a kind of a religious act. What a shame. Anyway, so this Korean guy, who was this man? So incredible, right? Um, uh, just touching on the humor part. Uh, it's such a difficult story. Uh, to tell uh, people and I always find that my audience whenever I'm speaking and I've been very lucky to get an opportunity to speak at various uh, events they, they they kind of get uh, you know like how is this person sitting in front of us if he if the person that he's talking about is himself um, so I have to bring in some comedy and make them laugh and and make them see that you know I look at this uh, tragedy as a as an experience i i because i'm alive and uh, it was a very difficult time in my life it was not a tragic time in my life it made me a much better person it made me wiser it, it made me understand things about the world and understand things about myself qualities in myself that i didn't even know existed that i hope i never have to touch <laughs> again on again but I grew from this experience. And whenever you grow from an experience, no matter how difficult it is, it's not tragic. So I never associate tragedy uh, with my kidnapping or actually even with my father's death. Because what he did for himself was leave a legacy. Not for me, but the thing about legacies is that they're endless, they're timeless. A hundred years from now, somebody could be inspired by his story and, you know, and do amazing things. And so there's no tragedy, you know, uh, I lost my father and I mourn him every day, but he died for something so much bigger than me. And I know what happened to me was very difficult and uh, very violent as well. But, you know, I came out of it with a smile. Really, I did because I got a second chance at life. And the comedy part is this entire thing is comical. If you think about it, you know, when they asked for the four billion rupees, it was $65 million. You know, people say I'm the highest ransom in Pakistan. I'm actually the highest ransom ever. There's, there's no ransom like this ever been asked. Now, just imagine, now, it's not been asked of Bill Gates' son. It's not been asked of, you know, Elon Musk's son. You literally just asked somebody who's never seen that. I mean, where are you going to get $65 million from? But they were convinced. And that's what I found very humorous. That no matter... And, and they conviction gave me uh, a lot of uh, suburb because I was like, you know, they, they, they really believe they're going to get this money. And to a point where I once joked with them and I was like, you, you know, if you do manage to get this kind of money, you should give me some as well. I mean, you know, <laughs> you should. I'm the reason you're getting it. Um, but it was crazy. Like the delusion was th nothing short of comedy. And even the events like there's, I'll, I'll tell you about the Korean because it was my mother, when I came back, the first thing she asked me was, where the hell was this man from? The Korean guy. <laughs> the Korean. Now, in their head, you know, they, they're very primitive in terms of, you know, in our societies, we have elite, we have upper class, middle class, lower middle class, and, you know, we have poverty. We have, we have these things structured and we understand when we see someone, who kiss kidder hai. It's, it's hmm. you know, just how our society works. But when you see these people, they're not part, part of anything that our society has ever shown us. They are primitive. They are primitive human beings. They are literally from a very, very God knows what time. And they're also barbaric, you know, it's because they, they've not lived in a society or, or at least not chose to be part of one. So they're very barbaric as well. You know, it's like literally being with cavemen and thinking this is some kind of a movie. You can't live like this and eat like this and speak like this and think like this. 
so the korean was an engineer he was studying electrical engineering which is also not an easy thing to study in korea and some jamaat e islami boys were studying there in some hostel and they usko musliman bana diya so you know they brought the brother into into faith but the faith wasn't enough for the brother because you know palestine and all of these tried you know just he couldn't take it so he got on a plane he got to pakistan he went and joined the imu and when he joined the imu he was like i think i'm a little above my head so <laughs> i'm definitely not a big fighter so he joined the media department where he would do editing and videos okay and, you know, english now koreans speak in an american accent but uzbeks speak in a russian accent uzbeks are under russian sphere of influence so you can't very rarely will you come across an uzbek who speaks in an american accent it means that his family and have been disassociated with the country for god knows how many decades and this is i'm i'm talking about before world war 2 because since then this is a russian sphere of influence to so much to a point where they call like islam naragadov or you know the names are of russian heritage now they essentially asian people they have nothing to do with russia they just live under that sphere so anyways this guy speaks with an american korean cowboy accent and he's the only one in all of waziristan who speaks like this and the isi i'm talking about like high level intelligence could not <laughs> understand he catch nimuna and he be like ma'am i'm going to tell you where to pick the body up from <laughs> <laughs> i'm just sitting over there like you know like it's funny like you know bugs bunny is going to be like pick my body but it's just hilarious the way that um <clears throat> but my i had a big laugh with my mother about it and i was like you know he was a little guy as well and very like he wasn't like as scary as he sounded on the phone like in real life of course he was cuz he had a clash in court um but funny and like you know even in my book sometimes it gets so dark that i have to tell you a funny story or right? something to also get you to keep going because it really it's a it's a dark story with moments of light um there's another very funny story about uh, my kidnapper and me where he tells me about uh, so basically he comes into my room at night and i lived there's no electricity and it's a mud prison so there's no light and uh, he walks in and in, they wear lights over here so he walks in and he's a very tall and scary looking very over imposing gloomy sort of you know dark character that's just how he was anyways and menacing and very thin as well so he sits on this uh, slight upper thing in the room and he's looking down at me and i thought you know it's another conversation of abusing my mother and abusing my father and telling me i'm an infidel and i'll be murdered and the angels will you know burn my soul in hell and uh, another one of these and these used to happen free, like almost every night he would come in and like start about my father then start about my mother then start about me mentally torturing me you know abusing my family telling me why i deserve for all of this to happen to me so he comes and he's like uh, they used to call me ahmed so he said ahmed where are the most beautiful women in the world so i just looked at him and i said this is a trick question before he cuts your head off so just say no i said i listen i don't even like women i don't know what you're talking <laughs> he said no 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 stop it i tell me just where are they you've been you've traveled so much tell me something So I said, uh, Brazil. I, I just really went to one end of the earth. I said Brazil. He said, No, I said it's too far. So tell me somewhere. So I said Iran. So he said, No, no, no. They kafirs, and we're going to conquer them anyways. So वो तो नहीं. We're not interested. And tell me something. What is it? Now I actually started to think because I said two things quickly, and the, you know they were instantly rejected. So I. I thought of Italy, and I have spent so much time there. It's such a beautiful country and a beautiful people. And I God, I hope that the entire country forgives me for this. But anyway, I said I love Italy, and I think you know Italian women are beautiful. And then I was about to say something else, and he goes, "Yes." Now he starts talking to himself. Okay, he goes, "Yes, Italian women." And when I conquer, now he's conquering Rome. so he's you know like if i want to do something i picture it i plan it i write it right uh, but he's like when i conquer rome so i know what he's picturing in his head is a war where he's now defeating the roman army but which hasn't existed for god knows how long um but anyway so he's now conquered rome and he's like i will make the vatican my harem 
So I just thought this man, I, and I've been to the Vatican and I was maybe 12 or 13 and I had a very profound experience where I saw something that, you know, mesmerized. I was just, I asked my father, how is this possible? And, you know, he said, and, you know, we spoke about it for hours and I was just completely taken by the Vatican. The Sistine Chapel. In the Sistine right? Chapel, of course. Yeah. You just keep watching it and, yes, you just, mesmerize. You know, you're mesmerized. This is an unbelievable human accomplishment. It's like watching the pyramids or, you know, one of these unbelievable human accomplishments. Anyways, many, many years later, we were being bombed out of Pakistan. And it was ferocious and it took seven days. It was quite grueling. We were being targeted by the Pakistani military on one side, by NATO and the US on the other side. We had to leave Pakistan and get into Afghanistan. So, you know, I mean, we're going from one hell into another. And when we finally did make it to Afghanistan, all of these guys fell in sajda and thanking, you know, God. And I, the, the Taliban guide looked at them and he's like, you know, a dog doesn't even sleep under the open sky over here. I don't know what you're thanking and praying God. I don't know what you're so happy about, but you're all about to die. <laughs> so, and he was in that, in those moments, you know, I, my kidnapper was sitting right next to me, so I looked at him and I was like, I went like this and I was like, Rome is the other way. <laughs> I started laughing. <laughs> and he just looked at me and, you know, he had this hatred in his eyes and it was like the years of pain and torture that he's, that he's inflicted on me. I almost felt like the scale had kind of balanced. He was so demoralized and, you know, his hopes and his dreams of conquering Rome and now we were going into, you know, little Afghanistan. <laughs> so, but, you know... I do that. Like I try and make people laugh. I try to show them how primitive really these these people are. And, and you are saying all these things against the backdrop that you were tortured and you were tortured seriously. They did something to your nails. And then you said, you know, at that uh, festival that the most painful thing for you was a loneliness. Please talk yeah. about it. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, uh, the humor is something that's part of my story. But, you know, the torture is is also very much part of it. Uh, that was a very difficult time. It was a time where I hadn't laughed. Actually, what they did to me led up to the humor. They tortured me and kept me in isolation for so long. And they were so brutal and they degraded me as a human being. You know, I was telling you that this was a funny conversation about Rome. But every night he would come and he would tell me, that your mother doesn't love you, that she's got a lover, that your wife has a lover, that your sister has, you know, trans, your brother is this. You just every day, they're spending their money. And, you know, this as a matter of fact, I remember three years into my kidnapping, once he came and he's like, you know, you're, he was in a rage. So he came in abusing me and saying, your brother's probably spent all your money and you're sitting here rotting. And I was like, yeah, three years before I was talking about this, I was like, 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 so, you know, so I, I, but I'd grown in where I was to a point where I could, instead of being a sub, very broken human being, I could stand up for myself and talk to them. You know, but that was a four and a half year long journey. In the beginning, it was isolation. It was torture. It was beatings. It was, you know, nails. They pulled all of my nails out. Um, they pulled uh, even from my feet. They, pu they pulled the nails out of my feet. Uh, they, they used to take knives and blades and they used to cut my back in straight lines and then across every day. And they used to throw salt on it. And all of this was videotaped for my mother. And she had to watch every section. She couldn't forward it. There were no pictures. They were detailed, disgusting videos. They would lash me every single day. And you know, the thing about getting beat was they call it a dara. Hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a whip that's made out of cow hide. And it's like leather. And it's very, uh, you know, basic in terms of how they stitch it and make it. But when it hits you, your muscle burst you know, like it just explodes and the swellings and like you know I, I i was also i was maybe 90 pounds i'm about 155 pounds right now um and you know i'm five eight five nine so i'm a decent height very decent weight uh but 90 pounds you know 85 pounds is like literally you I, you my bones were sticking and i had no mu i had no muscle i just i was just bones and they would bury me in the ground for 12 hours. Um, as a matter of fact, I was just, you know, I was sing, playing a, online yesterday, a uh, video game. 
and I started singing this uh, jihadi nashida. <laughs> My dadu looked at me. He's like, "Do you know what the hell you're saying?" And I was like, "Jandula, Jandula." <laughs> I was just playing, and I was zoned in. And my brothers just looking at me. He's like, "What the hell are you singing?" And I was like, "Yeah, I don't." You know, when we were tortured, karte the, they put a bucket on my head and put these nashidas mm-hmm. on. So I had to like try and <laughs> connect with the nashidas. So I don't go crazy. Um, but yeah, you know, they would carry out these horrific exercises to torture me. And then one day. Of all the funny things that they wanted to do, they came and they started cutting flesh out of my back, and that was probably the worst that they did. They, sh- I got shot. They shot me as well, but that was actually an accident. They did that by accident, um, but they shot me. <laughs> so, uh, but he basically he had a pistol. It was automatic. Mm-hmm. He came into my room. He was again screaming at me. Your mother is not doing this, and the gun went off, and he shot me clean through my uh, leg, and I have the I have a. You know the wound. It's a big part of. It's the best scar that I show people. I keep it for last. You know, this is my bullet wound as well. But I find humor in all of this now, because I had to fight it. I had to fight myself, my brain. And you mentioned the loneliness. Uh, solitary I, confinement. Yeah. Yeah. And you know the reason that I uh, talk about the torture and I laugh about it is because I can explain it to you in human terms. If my nail is being removed, yes, that is very painful. But if you're playing football and you kick the ball wrong and you break your nail and you have to go to the hospital, they'll remove it in the exact same manner. It's just a quick pull, and it pulls it out. And yes, there's pain, but you know, uh, it is what it is. We've broken bones, we've cut glass, sad uh, phatave, everything. Your car accident. You can understand pain. Pain is that it, it's something that anyone can explain to you. Yes, when someone inflicts it on you. It's abuse. Your personal space is violated. It's dehumanizing. But again, for me, the worst wasn't the torture. For me, the worst was that they were making my mother watch the torture. They were torturing her, and they were torturing me. And I'm a father now, and I, you know, my my son was unwell. I had to take him to the hospital. Us bichare ko tika lagta hai, wo cheek maarta hai, meri jaan nikal jaati hai. And every time I get worried about my child, I think about, I call my mother and I tell her how much I love her because I can't even imagine what I'm. You know, and that's me. That's on me. You know, people tell me it's not your fault. They did this. They did that. But the pain that my mother lived through, the trauma that she suffered as a mother, is nothing to what happened to me. Because I, like I said, I have a sense of triumph. That doesn't mean everyone has a sense of triumph. The people that saw this happen to me don't have a sense of triumph over it. They don't even find it that funny uh, when I talk about it in a funny manner. You know, it's a very dark period for them, a very haunting period for them. But the loneliness is something I. There's no words. There's uh, it is the darkest state that a human being can be left in. We are as creation not meant to be alone. That's why we're made in pairs. You know, whether you study religious texts or you study scientific texts, if a human being is is so isolated that he doesn't have one person, it's just you you can set the, you can tell them apart. You know, you can see that this person is suffering from loneliness. He's he's a complete, you know, he, nobody speaks to. Him. You can see this, and it's always odd. For other people, it's always odd. Why is he? Why doesn't he come out? Why is he alone? Or why is it? But even when we say that, you know, we're, we're not very social or whatever, we have a clan of ten people that we still have. You know, that we're we masla we call our brother, we masla we call this person. You know, there's always this human connection is impossible to rid yourself of. And we are, and this is how we are. We need intimacy. We need love. We need criticism. We need anger. We need, you know, all these different emotions with different people. We need arguments. We need agreements. We need to be, uh, you know, patronized. We need to be told we're right. We need to be told we're wrong. It's it's just how we are as as a creation. But to have nothing, no voice, no conversation, to be left completely alone with yourself, and you are the worst person to be. I mean, I, you know, I realized that I, you know, I had to really do a lot to remind myself that you know, you 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 are your company and good company. You've got good company, um, and and the reason for the humor comes from there, because I used to do stand-up comedy. I used to start singing. I used to recite my, you know, one of the funniest uh, things that my father taught me was Bahadur Shah Zafar's uh, poetry, and he used to say, "Kitna bad nasib hai Zafar dafan ke liye, do gaz zameen na mili koi yaar mein." And I used to think, how can something like this ever apply to, you know, what a king buried in, you know, 
in a in a jail and uh, and how many nights i spent thinking ke bahadur shah ki badkismati bad sirf uski nahi thi you know wo kehte hain ke jo jo sher hota hai wo ek se, wo it's 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 a, it becomes like a phrase it can apply to anyone you know and how funny that maine aaj tak kisi aadmi ko nahi mila aur mujhe to do gaz zameen mere vatan mein bhi nahi mili main to pata nahi kahan dafan hunga kis blast ke niche dafan hunga कोई फिदाई हमला होएगा कोई जेट की स्ट्राइक होएगी कोई इन बेवकूफ़ों में से होएगा कोई गलत गोश्त का कई गलत जगह से काट देंगे तो ऐसे खून निकलेगा कि मतलब यू नो दे डेंट इवन मीन इट और मैं मार गया सो एनी वज आई यूज टू एंटरटेन माय सेल्फ विद दिस आयरनी एंड विद ऑल द थिंग्स बट इन द बिगिनिंग वेन आई यूज थिंक अबाउट माई मदर्स वॉइस इट 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 बिकेम दिस ओवरवेलमिंग बर्डन दैर आई कैन नेवर एक्सप्लेन टू द मेमरी ऑफ माई लाइफ before my kidnapping made me suicide it drove me over the edge because i could not believe how could i have had so much and how do i have nothing i don't even have a pot i can't even i don't even have a loo anymore i use a bucket you know you really <laughs> go uh, from you know you, you you i'm not saying i i'm at the top but i live a great life very fulfilled and happy life i mujhe alhamdulillah itna wo nahi hai kisi cheez ki zarurat nahi hai i have everything so i can never explain to you uh, what that feeling of helplessness and loneliness do teen cheeze isme nikal ke aati hain ek to dekhiye aap kahan aasman pe the achanak zameen pe aa gaye hain dono zindagiyan bilkul alag hain bahut achhi tarah se khoobsurat tareeke se aapne usko bayan kiya ki ek waqt tha jab aapke paas sab kuch tha lavishly sari cheeze so entitled so privileged aur dusri taraf कुछ भी नहीं है जो बेसिक चीजें हो सकती हैं वो भी नहीं है एक बात और जो मैं जानना चाहता हूं आपसे आई रियली वांट टू अंडरस्टैंड फ्रॉम यू दिस द वेरी थॉट ऑफ डाइंग इन फ्यूटिलिटी लाइक फॉर एग्जांपल अ सोल्जर यू नो कैस्केल्ड इन एन एनकाउंटर पीपल लेटर रिमेंबर दिस पर्सन एज अ काइंड ऑफ अ मार्टर सो देर इज अ पर्पज फॉर अ सर्टन डेथ एंड प्रोबेबली देर इज नो पर्पज यू नो For I, yeah, I spent I spent a lot of time thinking what a purposeless life I've lived, lived. and what a you know so everybody will remember me as very oh bichara you know bichara yeah, Shabazz was a nice guy got kidnapped and beheaded on you know camera it's just not something you know I'm not saying that I was born to do something incredible but I was born and I do deserve to live my life. Um, on my own terms you know um and it, it's a very haunting feeling to come to terms with death especially for a 26 27 year old um and it, it's not coming from a place of it literally i can't tell you like i remember the first time i heard a jet strike and how i f- explained the fear of jets but you know after 20 strikes i i was also relatively like not as quick running and it was okay like routine mein you know mm. um and that is kind of you know when you see death i'll tell you something forget all the the outside events that could kill me wo to chalo with my kidnappers when they shot me that was one of the last things and removing of the flesh these these two three things were some of the last things that they did to me but what they did actually by doing all this was empower me I came to a point with them where I was like I now just every human nerve ending of mine had been torn apart so pain was I felt it now you have to give me death or you will give me respect you know some form and that was a very difficult situation for my kidnappers they act accidentally and but they countered it but they countered it in a, in, in in the worldly sense so when he told me that I can't kill you because to my your mother has uh, four of my guys I started laughing and I was like after all this time the worst mistake you made was tell me that you can't kill me because I don't I don't care about you. I'm, I'm not even scared of you anymore. and he looked at me and he smiled he was me and him were big you know back and forth and he looked at me and for all the arguments that I won against him they you know he won as many against me and his were more demoralizing victories because it was always personal and uh, when I told him that you know the worst mistake you ever made was tell me you can't kill me and he looked at me and he's like i never wanted to kill you 
and he just looked around. He's like, all of this will kill you. I never wanted to kill you. I want money. Pay me and go home. You are listening to the Cine Inc. podcast show, My Book. Shehbaz Taseer, the author of the book, Lost to the World, A Memoir of Faith, Family and Five Years in Terrorist Captivity, is in conversation with Parvez Alam. His much-talked-about book has been published by Penguin Random House. Please visit our website for other podcasts in Hindi, Urdu and English at cineinc.com. Cine Inc. is a hub of podcasts based in London. Shabazz, uh, there are some uh, women as well here in your book yes. and uh, there are some characters and uh, they are obviously real characters. It's a true story. It's about your experience in captivity and uh, the torture that you had to face. And then you talk about some women who were very different from these men. Uh, so that's the difficult thing. I, I'll try and explain it to you. A little. So my kidnapper's mother-in-law actually stopped my torture. My kidnapper's mother-in-law was Muhammad Tahir Farooq's wife. She raised her children to be just like my kidnappers and was very proud of the IMU and what all of her husband's accomplishments were. She was the first name on the group's suicide list. The first name. It was a symbolic gesture for other suicide bombs. If we have then we will send them to them. So we will never end up. She believed in everything that they believed in. This was her foundation. She never thought that anything that her son-in-law or her husband or her ch- son or her, her daughters or their grandchildren or anyone or anyone in the group that they ever did anything that was wrong. That they were on haq, that they were mujahid, mujahideen and that everything that they did was right. Kill people, murder them, however they did it. 100% on board. That's why you have to understand the miracle in this moment saving my life. Because if she saw me on a Sunday afternoon on the street light and she was on her you know, regular blow-up mission, she would not hesitate for a second. She'd take my life, she'd take my kid's life, she'd take my wife's life. She wouldn't care about women, children, men. As a matter of fact, she teaches women and children how many women and children they've had to live. So to remove that element from their work, or these people remove that element from you, that mercy, they remove it from you. And it, it's through practice and training. I can't just tell you stop caring about women and children. I have to train you to stop caring about women and children. So that when you go and carry out these attacks, they're indiscriminate. You go into a mosque, you don't hesitate. You go into a school, you don't hesitate. You shoot children in the head, no mercy. You go to women's markets and blow them up. By the thousands, there's no mercy. And this is taught to you. Just like we are taught not to do all this. It's a lifelong of, uh, of education. And Aya, I call her Aya, was of that world. But when they were removing the flesh from my back, I was screaming and I was in so much pain and I'd been living in a house for six, seven months. I don't know how this woman broke barriers. She, she actually broke barriers to get to me because they live behind a parda system. And it's not an Afghan parda system or a Pathan parda system or a, uh, you know, Glohari parda system. It's none of it. it is the highest form of Shariai parda system that you can find in any text. It's not even the voice of the woman will be heard by a man. Let alone her tearing down the barriers that restrict her, coming in and screaming at men, saying, I'll tear the whole house down if you don't let this mm. guy and she saved my life because they removed three pieces of flesh or four pieces they removed, but they wanted to do it on the other side as well. So it wasn't going to end. And I was standing um, in Pakistan. We have these bowls that are these plastic things that we wash clothes in. And, you know, they're fairly large. And, and so I was actually standing in one of those and it was filled with my blood. And I, my color had become like, you know, like it took me three, four months to recover from this. And they couldn't stitch me. They were open wounds. I cannot explain to you what they did to me. It was like, you don't even do that to animals. You just, you know, their death is more merciful. And in all of this chaos, this woman found me and saved my life. Literally, she saved me. How did she save you? She came in, basically. Now, you know, she was also Miss, Miss, the, the Prime Minister's wife. <laughs> the Prime Minister may be Shaheed, but she's got that standing. 
and this was her son in law so she tore through these barriers she said leave him alone get the hell out of my house no one is going to do whatever you opened over here and the main thing that she emphasized was that he is a guest in my house he is my guest and that's it get out so she threw the three uh, guards who were helping you know cut me the son in law had to stay but he was furious he was in a state of rage like how dare you come in and interrupt all this she was my daughter will leave you get out of the house you know these are not conversations that you have with men over there she broke every kind of like you know ceiling that 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 was set by her she smashed and and she saved my life and she made her own son take me and matlab jaise bhi heal karna hai just food um i mean i had access to taking a shower uh, once a week i got toothpaste toothbrush shampoo but she given me all this very early on when i came into her house and then i was teaching her children and I, i used to spend time with her kids you know uh, not her children her grandchildren her children's children and her son and i taught him urdu and you know like we t- stories i used to paint with them there's some very tragic stories as well in in me teaching them and some of the things that i learned horrible like a 3 year old girl just uh, her name was fatima and basically fatima was uh, aya's granddaughter mohammed ali's uh, wife's daughter from her first husband so women over here unfortunately also married 3 4 times because you know the men have a very short life span so anyways um fatima was 3 years old now you have to understand i have children so i can see a brilliant child fatima was a brilliant child she could speak at maybe you know very well she could speak very well by one and a half like proper now i have children as well and i know by that age they are speaking but not as well as she was and they definitely couldn't read and they definitely couldn't learn another language as quick and it's not coming from their parents it's literally coming from someone who can't even read and write so this brilliant child and i are sitting and i'm making a coloring uh, drawing for her i was drawing a truck and i would and wo apne taraf kuch aur bana rahi thi you have to be very careful with what you paint you can't draw animals and humans because that's in kid duniya mein it's considered mm. haram it's always cars and a fruit or, or or something like that so anyways i drew this truck and i was painting it pink and i was making a flower on the door and that's when she looked and she's like what and she and you know now i have a daughter as well i've seen anger i've seen abhi wo kya kehte hain ziddi sad cry everything i've seen all the emotions that children can express but i've never seen rage i've never seen rage in a in a 3 year old mm. or 4 year old it's just not something they even know about and she was in a rage she was shaking and she's like what have you done to my dachshund and dachshund is what they call these hyalaxes mm. and i had to carry out my fidai hamla in it as in my suicide attack was in this car and who's going to take me seriously with your flower and i just i just remembered looking at this child and and feeling devastated like what the, what have we done as a, as human beings that there is a 3 year old child i don't care who her father is and who her mother is but this is what i wanted to be a doctor or an astronaut she wants to be a suicide bomber at 3 but this indoctrination came from aya jan her father was always out her father was dead when she was a child the second one was a step father couldn't care less and you know this is they live in these devastating circumstances but anyways this family my kidnapper my torturer my abductor's family is the one that saved my life mm. it's you know it's almost uh, from god like it's it's a miracle uh, i haven't even spoken about uh, his brother in law abdul aziz aya's son mohammad tahir farooq son uh, in this book that much but you know he he also like you know as far as the story is concerned he was i always when i used to speak to him and look at him i always felt like this man has been born in the wrong he wasn't a fighter he was a medic and he was weak because he'd been shot as a 13 year old by a helicopter so his you know he he was very weak and frail and uh, just nothing aggressive no aggressive in no anger no nothing no resentment at the wound that he had you know the life that he'd lived lost his father lost so many people that he knew nothing just fine and he even asked me once he's like you know if i was ever in lahore do you think your friends would like accept me or something and i thought about it because the answer is no but i was like i think my friends would be very grateful because you saved my life um and he did 
he saved my life multiple times you know i did that one incident but he he also saved my life many times. saved your but life this, multiple times but then at the end of the day you were not freed you were yeah. not uh, released from their prison uh, yeah. you were still of their course. prisoner and they Actually, were they all hoping to die yeah uh, they were hoping that one I, day I, they would get the them. rest Mm. Yeah, and by the way, my kidnapper till the day he died, that delusion never left him. He kept me there for four years under the delusion or the illusion or whatever you want to say that I will get my ransom. Okay, so Shabas, let me come back to the end end of this story. I mean, your book is about so many things, but then this part where one day you are free. I mean, that's absolutely. you know non climatic in a way that you yeah, you know yeah. there's a kind of a crescendo yeah. and then there's so much lull and there's no kind of a grand finale yeah, but always, obviously for you for your family it's a huge finale <laughs> it's a grand finale the yeah, sun is I, back i i always laugh and say you know if, if they ever made a movie so instead of act, like the escape is fun but yeah it is a bit like anti climatic So I was like, maybe you know, I can put on like an Iron Man suit, and you can continue into the Avengers, you know, <laughs> something cool, like because it's it's as crazy as it sounds. I cannot tell you how intense the experience was till the doors to my freedom opened, and I was like, really, <laughs> this is this is it, and it was so um, I did not even believe it, you know, really. Um, uh, I'll take you through a little briefly, so. basically the uzbeks and the taliban got into went to war so how i was telling you about how they were so close and the importance of these people to the taliban is actually the end of the story which is how they fell apart it's like two brothers two brothers falling apart and going to war with each other um and i always think of aurangzeb and dara sheikh for some reason when i think of the uh, uzbeks and uh, um the afghan taliban because the uzbeks actually used to think of themselves as invaders as well they used to have a sense of ownership it was crazy so i've never heard all of, i mean i knew that babur was uzbek and you know i understand all this but i never understood the kind of you know like the so they think this group is that we were the original conquerors we are the moguls but the moguls were not indians they were uzbeks you are indians we invaded you we turned you into muslims you were indians uh, hindus both parasts we made you worship allah and i just thought you know i know he came he had his angle but no one had quite put it like that before this man so you know this great conquerors and then they like this with the taliban and they had a fight because the uzbeks went with isis they they believed that isis is the caliphate so the afghan taliban butchered them in that butchery a road was opened and you know it led to my eventual freedom but the man who helped me escape from the prison that i was in i offered him a ransom and i literally i told him just don't go stupid like 65 million dollars but if you ask for something reasonable i'm sure you'll get it and if you have one or two brothers stuck in some hell hole i'm sure that if they can find them they'll get you that but get me out of it so he looks at me and this is the funniest part of my, about my story because he goes he looks at me and he goes we don't believe in kidnapping and ransom the afghan taliban don't believe in kidnapping and ransom i said and what about your subsidiaries this is like ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> how can how can you not believe in kidnappings and ransom you've taken 4 years of my life and all of your subsidiaries all of these uzbeks and al qaidas and all these guys they have have you read the news um anyway so he said look you're going to leave this prison you're going to walk down a certain road and there's nothing here you're in the middle of nowhere so the first houses that you see you have to go to them and they're going to quetta they'll take you up and he told me don't converse with these people because i had made up a story how i'm a fighter from england and i've come here to do jihad and you know i made up this whole you his name was yusuf britania so he said no more like don't definitely don't say you speak urdu or anything because you have to go to balochistan as well so just be quiet um but i made up quite an elaborate uh, story of who i was anyways the in, it took me 7 days from that prison to reach a town outside of quetta um and when i reached that town till the moment i reached that town those 7 days every second of those 7 days i believed that there would be a trade that they would exchange me for some ransom and they'd take me to a safe house in pakistan or wherever and teen char mahine mein ab ye masla khatam ho jayega and they come to a peaceful resolution and i won't be tortured or kept in some 
ridiculous inhumane conditions because you know these seem like human beings that's how much i'd been through that a man telling me that they're going to take you home did not make sense and literally on the 7th of may uh 7th of may i can't even remember sorry 7th of uh, march uh, is when i came home on the 7th of march after fajr i woke up and i was getting ready to get on the bike with these guys and one of them looked at me and he said where's your mahajir card i said what what are you talking about so he said he's you know cuz i don't speak any language so he's communicating in sign language and he's like mahajir card sta mahajir card mahajir card immigrant immigration immigration so i said passport i cuz i didn't know what he's saying so i was like you want i don't have a passport he's like card id i ah mm. mahajir card ko bhi wo kuch keh raha tha card mm. whatever his word was so i said no 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 i don't have any id are you crazy so you know he 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 was like this is the taliban so he went to the other taliban and they had like a little <laughs> like a little discussion and then he came back to me and he said like, you sir we can't take you because they'll arrest us on the check post you don't have a card man how are you going to go home so i said don't worry i'll you guys go i'll find my way <laughs> so so they left me and they left uh, they drove off and uh, i walked and walked and walked and finally found some like a motorcycle with like a rickshaw accommodation and i offered him 5000 rupees and said take me to quetta so he said get on 5000 rupees no problem get on i the guy who let me go gave me 15000 rupees so by the way i was kidnapped for 65 million but i came back with 15000 <laughs> uh this is why the business part of my description is very important to me <laughs> the author thing is that but the business one is very absolutely important. business one yeah <laughs> so he stops outside this town now this is the first time i've seen civilization in four and a half years and he it's a place called kuchlak i've never heard of it in my life and he says i can't uh, do you have your mahajir card so i literally started laughing i was like i don't have a mahajir card and don't worry just take me my plan was i'll get off at the check post and be like i'm home <laughs> i'm home uh, so anyways now he started freaking out he said yeah you are a taliban you know like he's speaking to me in urdu ish pashto and saying ke you are a taliban and you will get into a lot of trouble what are you doing so the first thing that i asked for was a pay form and he turned around again he was shocked and he said pay phones have been obsolete for 2 3 years where have you been what who are you <laughs> so then i got a phone i called my mother and uh, you know i just said listen you know i'm going to believe this <laughs> my mother had no contact with me for almost a year so they i was presumed dead as well of course my family refused to accept it but i was presumed dead there was no search there was no negotiation there was nothing for one year almost 8 months or something they literally thought my mother is a mad woman because she was saying co- establish contact they were like your son's dead uh, every time she'd say establish contact they said there is no contact we've not heard from the middleman in months i think he is dead you need to come to terms with him so you know randomly i call her from a bazaar in kuchlak and uh, yeah and then you know here i am <laughs> berlin the book has been very well received you have been I'm, giving lots of interviews you appeared on uh, various bbc yeah. shows and i love that. the bbc me and the bbc i like you know while i was kidnapped i used to listen to the bbc so all the anchors like razia ikbal lee james there's so many more uh, saima mohsen bbc urdu journalist bbc english journalist voice of america urdu journalist uh, journalist zena badavi Yeah, Zainab. Uh, it's horrible of me because I've forgotten uh, the the man's name uh, who does hard talk as well. But you know, I used to listen to all of. It's Stephen Sacker. Stephen Sacker. So you know, I I I followed these guys for three or four years, and you have to understand the radio is a very different medium. I don't know what kind of love journalists get on television when people are watching them, but I've seen people watching the news, and it's very like they get the information, they don't get, you know, and they switch the thing, they switch. but it come hote and they start connect but i was like connected with them in a way that i came back and i wrote them all letters i emailed all of them and said you don't understand you were my window i had i lived in darkness till you brought in the light into my life i followed man united you know lee james uh, works for bbc and wo, he used to go over the games 
and I used to listen to the live commentaries and I'm an older generation. I'm 39. You know, my Walkman, my uh, my kids and all don't even know what a cassette or a VHS or any of this stuff. And it's crazy because I used to say, make the same jokes with my father. When he used to talk about black and white TV and we'd be like, what are you talking about? And radio. You know, radio is, a, is not a form of a medium for my generation. Hmm. It's a medium for the generation before me. And to have it as the only thing that I had for so long, I have such a deep connection with it. I go on the shows and it's such a pleasure to be able to talk and tell people my story. And Okay, this is what I want to understand that <coughs> talking about your ordeal and also writing this book and appearing on talk shows, discussing various things, uh, various uh, facets of uh, terrorism, Pakistan, political situation, all those things. How has it helped you in terms of trying to understand that it's a different life for you now and that chapter is over? How much has it helped you? I have to be honest with you. Writing this book was a healing exercise. Not just for me, but for my family as well. Um, and you know, like you come face to face with a lot of demons that maybe even you're trying to brush on the look up. And you have to go over these things very extensively. And like I said, no matter what the experience is, if it's an experience, no matter how difficult, you grow. And even with the interviews and with all the talks that I'm doing, I, I remember the first one that I did, I was a nervous wreck. Um, sweating and I'm a very nervous person. I'm not an open person. I'm not trained for this. I have no training in this. Um, it's all <laughs> off cuff. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that sometimes I say more than I should or, you know, the wrong thing. But it's the most amazing gift that my experience and my life has given is the opportunity to be able to sit with people and talk to them about this very difficult situation and also make it enjoyable for them. They hear about it and they enjoy the conversation. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get it ahead of myself, but like we're having a nice conversation and, you know, we've been talking for a while. And time just sometimes uh, I'm trying to sum up too much in too little uh, time, but I can, but I make these amazing connections with people and, and they connect and, and we talk about it. And you can see there's maybe I'm, I, the only time you'll feel sadness in me is when I speak about my father or when I speak about the pain that my mother's had to endure, because those are people that I love and that's not my own pain. That, I mean, it is my pain, it affects me, but it's pain that's caused to other people that, you know, I love a lot. And uh, the fact that my mother had to watch these videos after the way that my father was taken from her, you know, he's my dad, but he was her partner, uh, you know, the person that she chose to spend the rest of her life with. And now she, and now she doesn't have that. And it's a part of her life that she doesn't have. And as a married man with children, I could not imagine a life without my partner and it's a very difficult thing to do for someone to go through but it's the only time you feel sadness because it's a it's a wound like i said it, it can't heal but my own experience is you know i i make it try to make it interesting and the thing about the interviews is it's part of promoting the book and i want to get this to as many people you know i want people to read it not for my experience in particular but my family's story as well because I always tell people, a lot of people say this to me in the West, um, that, you know, your father was, was buried, but his killer was celebrated in a sea of people. And I always say to them, a sea of people or a hundred thousand people? A sea of people would be a million people. That's a sea. And that's 5% of Pakistan's population. A sea of people mourned my father and mourned his, the, in the manner in which we lost him. A sea of people was silent about it because a few people were armed, dangerous and in the streets. And people in general in societies are not armed and dangerous. And so they mourned him in silence. And, and you know, sometimes they say that the, si that, that the silence is haunting. It's too loud, you know, in Pakistan. And we allowed that narrative for the West to have this narrative that, you know, Mumtaz Qadri is celebrated in Pakistan. He's not. You got a hundred, barely a hundred thousand people come out. You kill the governor of Punjab on blasphemy in a Muslim country and you can't get more than a hundred thousand people. I mean, it's not a sea. So 
you know there's trauma associated with that but i really i want people to read my family story and my father's story and and that chapter about the day that he died and what he died for and what he stood for and why i have a sense of triumph over my experience because it's related to his death you couldn't kidnap me for a better reason whatever we have discussed uh, is uh, in your book and in fact is much more fascinating much more interesting and much more anecdotal as well just recite some of your favorite poetry or maybe uh, the poetry that you heard from your father um wo kya sunate the jab unka dil karta tha khaas taur pe aapko ya aap unse sunna chahte the i'll tell you a poem uh, i'll tell you a dada's poem i i felt like this poem was written for abba it's just a small part of it uh bhulo na taaseer ki baatein kab tak usko yaad rakhoge दुश्मन तक को भूल चुके हो हमको कब तक याद रखोगे एंड आई फेल्ट लाइक यू नो दिस माय दादा रिटन लॉर ऑफ पोएम्स बट आई थिंक ही रोट दिस वन फॉर अब्बा एंड नॉट अ लॉर ऑफ पीपल न्यू इट एंड इट्स समथिंग दैट यू नो व्हेन ही डाइड दीज वर्ड्स स्टे विद मी एंड इफ यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड द डेप्थ ऑफ व्हाट माय दादा इज ट्राइंग टू स्टे से देन यू विल अंडरस्टैंड that you know my father's legacy is written in blood unfortunately you know he was murdered in the most brutal manner but uh, the only two organs of his that survived were his heart and his mind and they were untouched and uh, like i said he left a legacy much bigger than me so you know dushman tak ko bhul chuke ho humko kab tak yaad rakhoge i hope that that stays with my country and i hope you know abba said something um that as a son i would wish felt that you know i wish i was my father in his last moments because you know he felt like this and he wrote that i won't give up on asia even if i'm the last man standing and i always felt like you know i wish my father never had to write that or feel that you know i wonder where he must have been in his last few days where he felt that you know i'm the last man standing and there's no one with me but i'm going to keep fighting and i hope that sulman tasir is not the last man standing and uh, that there are always men and women um who fight for what's right thank you very much uh, shabas main bas itna kahunga chalte chalte ke aapki jo bhi baatein hain maine jaise bhi suni wo do jagah aap se baatein karti hain yani aap ki jo kahani hai wo do jagah asar bhi karti hai ek dil pe aur dimag pe dimag bar bar ye sochta hai ke ye jo kuch bhi hua mazhab ke naam pe ye ek level pe kahin bada fraud tha aur wo silsila jo fraud ka hai wo aap के जो वाल साहब हैं सलमान तासीर साहब उनके एसेसिनेशन से शुरू होता है जिसमें कोई मतलब नहीं था उनको इस तरह से मारने का और उसके बाद में फिर कोई मतलब नहीं था आपको किडनैप करने का उसका कोई मजहब से ताल्लुक नहीं था उसका किसी किस्म की तहरीक से कोई ताल्लुक नहीं था क्या बदनसीबी है और अनफॉर्चुनेटली दिस हैपन बट देन यू हैव रिटर्न सच अ ब्यूटिफुल बुक एंड पीपल आर लाइक इंग इट दे आर रीडिंग इट and we will run details about your book on this program uh, so thank you very much thank you sir it was such a pleasure to uh, talk to you and thank you so much for having me really thank it was you. wonderful lost to the world a memoir of faith family and five years in terrorist captivity by shahbaz tasir has been published by penguin random house and is available on various outlets you've been listening to my book podcast show produced by the london based hub of podcasts you can write to us the email is post@cineinc.com my name is parvez alam thank you for listening goodbye